Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom and welcome back to today's Daf Yomi. Brachas Daf Chaf, we're four lines from the top. Amalei Rav Papal Abayi. Now the Gemara is continuing on the topic of the fact that a Jew, a Yid, is willing to be Moisnefesh to sacrifice his own dignity, his covet, so that he does not transgress an Avera Isin. Continues the Gemara. Amalei Rav Papal Abayi. Maishna, why is it so? Why is there a difference between Rishonim, the earlier generations? This Rachash Lunissa, they have experienced miracles. They had Nisim. Oh, Maishna, no, no. Why are we different? The Loi Misrachash Lunissa. That we don't experience these miracles. What is the reason? Imishim Tsnui is the reason because of the level of learning. That their learning was on a much higher level, on a much higher caliber than ours. That cannot be so. Because Vishnei, the Rabbi Yehuda, in the days of Rabbi Yehuda, the entire learning, their entire focus and expertise was merely in Seder Nazikin. Rashi says this is referring to the three Bavis, Bava Kama, Bava Metziah, Bava Basra, so their expertise was limited to those topics. However, by us, we're well versed in the entire six portion, six dharam of Gemara Mishnayis. In fact, Bechiyavamati, Rabbi Yehuda Be'uktsin, when Rabbi Yehuda would arrive at the difficult topics discussed in Taharis regarding Tum of Tahara, for instance, the Mishnah of Ha'isha Shekeveshes Yarab Kedera, a woman who was pickling, preserving vegetables in a pot, and some say it was a different Mishnah of Amrila, Zaysim Shekevashim Mitzrafeyan, olives that were pickled with their leaves intact, the Mishnah says Tahirim, they are Tahir, they cannot contract Tuma. These are difficult topics discussed in Seder Taharis. So when Rabbi Yudu would arrive at these topics, he would say they're so difficult, they're so obscure. Omar, he would proclaim, I see all the difficulties that Rav and Shmuel asked and debated and discussed in the Gemaras. I see these missions being just as difficult. They're obscure to me. However, Anan, in our days, this is Rav Papa speaking to Abaye, by us nowadays, Kamas Ninon Be'uktsin, Tleisam Resifta, we have 13 different academies, 13 different yeshivas that are heavily involved in these topics of Tumah Tahara. So apparently, our learning surpasses theirs. However, with regard to Tanis and to miracles, it is very different. Fi'ilu, Rav Yehuda ki avashol of Chad Mesane, when Rav Yehuda would remove one, one of his shoes in affliction, Asimitra, rain would immediately come. Hashem would listen to his prayer, to his affliction. Vanan, however, by us, come it's arina on an option. We afflict ourselves, or mitzar ourselves, or mitzvah kachinon, and we cry out in tfila and pain. Valais the mashkachbon, and nobody pays heed to us, nobody pays attention. So apparently, our power of tfila, our power of prayer, is not as potent as theirs. Why is that so? Why were they more capable than us in? Arousing Rachmanus mercy from heaven. Amrle, so you know what Abayi told him? It's not the quantity, it's the quality. Kamoi, the early ones, the ones who lived in the previous generations, have a kamasri naf shayak dush Hashem. They would sacrifice themselves, they would be moistened and nefesh themselves for the sake of Hashem's name. We're not on that level. We don't display the same level of sacrifice for Hashem and His Torah. Therefore, they merited a great tziyat d'shmaya, heavenly assistance, and Hashem answered that tefillahs very quickly. For instance, an example of Mesir Nefesh from the early generation, says the Gemara Kihah, like the following story. The Rav Adabar Ava, Chazze, he noticed, la he kusses a non-Jewish woman, that have a Slavisha Karbalto, she's wearing this, this dress, this red dress, which was ostentatious and wasn't appropriate for a Jewish woman. He mistook her for a Jewish woman. So he saw the Havaslavisha Karbalta, she was wearing this Karbalta dress, Bishukha in the market. Savar, the Vasisrol, he thought it was a Jewish woman, and it was inappropriate. Come carry me. He went and he ripped it off from her. Aglai Milsa turned out the Kusasi, that she was not a non Jewish woman, and Shaimua, Ba'abu Me'azuze, they evaluated his fine, they estimated his fine, they set his knas with the amount of 400 Zuz he needed to pay. Amale is so. Rav Adabarav turned to the woman and he said, Mashimech, what's your name? Amale, she said, Matum. Amale, ah, that's a remez, that's a hint to the results of what happened. Matum, Matum. 
Twice mutton is Arameya, because mutton resembles the word of Mason, in Aramaic means 200. So twice Mason equals 400, Meir Zuz Arba Meir Zuz Shavya equals the 400, the amount that I need to pay on account of having done what I did. Some say that the Remez, the hint is a little different, that Mutton means patience. Had I displayed a bit of patience, I, would, I could have saved myself this trouble. Continues the Gemara. Rav Gidol have a ruggle to have a ka'azul v'yas v'ashari tefillah. Rav Gidol, this was his custom, this was his practice, he would sit by the entranceway to the women's mikvah. Why did he do that? He did that to help them. Amar l'hu hachi tefillu v'achi tefillu. He would instruct them, this is how you should be tevil, this is how you should be tevil. He would provide them with halacha guidance. Amar le Rabbanon, how do you do this? V'ayim kamistafi mar me yitzahara, are you not afraid of the yitzahara that will incite you? You're sitting in a place where women are going to the mikvah, how do you do that? Amr lehu, it's no concern to me, Damini Bapoi, they appear to me merely kikhaki chivri, like white geese. I'm not incited by them, I'm not affected in any way. He was on such a high spiritual level that it didn't bother him. Continues Gemara, another similar story, it's Rabbi Yechanan. Rabbi Yechanan have a ruggle, have a ka'azal Yosef. His custom was that he would go and place himself, ashari tefila, by the entranceways of the women's mikvah. Omar, he said, this is why I'm doing it. When the women come up from Ba'asim Etfilah, from immersion, they should gaze at me. And as a result, they should merit to have Zara, children, the Shviri Kavase, that are as beautiful as me. The Gemara explains elsewhere, the Rav Yechanan said, I am a remnant, I remained from the beauty of Yerushalayim. Rabbi Yechonah resembled the beauty of Yerushalayim in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. So Rabbi Yechonah wanted to do a chesed, to do a kindness with Jewish women so that they can gaze at him at this appropriate time prior to their zivuk, which is a skula, which is a merit, to produce children in the same form. Amadir Rabbonon like a mustafi yimar bisha. How are you not afraid of Ayin Hara? When you place yourself at, that, at this juncture and you allow people to view you and to see your beauty, what about I and her, an evil eye that may result as, as a consequence? Now, there's two ways to explain I and her. The Mfarshim explain that it can either be as a result of jealousy. If somebody sees something that belongs to somebody else or a myla, a quality that somebody has and arouses jealousy, this can evoke the evil eye, the evil power in the world, and can actually affect that person to, to his detriment. The Maral explains another point that when somebody is zeicha, somebody possesses good qualities, he possesses wealth, beauty, etc., it is his duty not to bring others to jealousy, not to display, to flaunt his qualities, as to not arouse, not to arouse somebody else's jealousy and bring them pain. By doing so, in heaven, they perhaps will reevaluate whether he's indeed worthy of what he has. A person is meant to, to keep away and to keep what he has, the qualities that, is, that he has, to keep it away from the public eye. So this is what the Chachamim, this is how they confronted Rabbi, Rabbi Yechon. They questioned him, how are you not afraid of Ayin Hura by sitting over there where the women come and have them gaze at you? So he said, Amar Lahu, there's no concern. I'm a descendant of Yosef. The leishaltebe ein abisha. I know how the evil high will not affect a child of Yosef. Why? The chesiv bein peres Yosef, the son of a charming Yosef in peres ali oyin, son of the charming Yosef who is ali oyin. Says the Gemara, what does ali oyin mean? Vamar vo al tikri ali oyin. Instead of reading ali oyin, read ela oyin le oyin, which means that they are. They, they're surpassed the ayin. They're on top of the ayin. The ayin, the power of the eye, cannot affect the Zara the Yosef, the children of Yosef. They're above it. We have another source for this concept that the children of Yosef are not affected by ayin hara. Because it says, They should multiply like fish in the Karva Oretz in the land. Madogim Shabayam. The comparison to fish is as follows, just like fish in the sea. They multiply and they become many and they increase to great numbers. Why? 
Because my machas malayim, ve'inayin harasha letas behem, then the depths of the sea, the water covers them over, and no ayin hara, no evil eye can reach them. Therefore, they have a skula. They're able to multiply and increase great fold. Similarly, avzare shal Yosef, the pasuk that compares Yosef's children to fish, avzare shal Yosef, ve'in ayin harasha letas behem, the ayin har can't, can't be shot behem, can't affect him. Another pshat, another reason why the Ayin Haro is not a concern regarding the children of Yosef, says the Gemara, Ayin Shalai Rata Salazan Mimash Ayin Shalai, and I, and I, the eyes of Yosef at Tzaddik, we should not want to enjoy something that wasn't his, the wife of his master, Pritifar. Therefore, on that merit, that's chus, mida connected, mida measure for measure, Ayin Ayin Hara, Shalatas boy, the Ayin Haro cannot. Be sure that it cannot affect him or his children. So in conclusion, we have three rayas, three proofs for this concept, that Yosef and his descendants were above the control of Ayin Hara, either the Pasuk of Ben Purus, Oile Oyen, they're above the eye, or the Pasuk that compares them to fish that are beyond the power of the Ayin Hara. And the last Gemara, that it was Mida Kenegin Mida, since he refused to use his eyes inappropriately, refused to enjoy from a site that was inappropriate, therefore in exchange, midah connected midah, he was not affected by Ayin Hora. Now the Bach makes an interesting point. We have two incidents mentioned in the Gemara, and they're both presented a bit differently than the other. The first one says, that regarding Rav Gidol, that he sat at Shari Tefillah, so that he can instruct them how to be toivah. The Gemara says, Amr the Rabban, the Rabban challenged and he said, are you not concerned with the Yetzirah? However, in the second story, regarding Rav Yechanan, the Rabbanon challenged them by saying, Are you not concerned with the Ayin Hara? Why in the first story does the Gemara not mention Ayin Hara? And why in the second story does the Gemara not mention Yetzir Hara? So the Bach explains the very interesting difference between the two stories. In the first story, of Giddel was sitting there, not in a manner that they would gaze on him. He was sitting there perhaps on the way down to the mikvah, meaning he was standing in a place where they would pass on the way going to the mikvah. It wasn't for the purpose of being misbeined and contemplating his form and his surah and gazing at him, like in the case of Rabbi Yechon. It was simply to be there to instruct them. So therefore there's no concern of Ayn Har, which only applies to one who notices beauty and gazes and concentrates on it. So the, of the concern over there was simply because of the Yitzhahar. Are you not afraid of being saved by the Yitzhahar? And he responded, no. I'm not concerned because to me they're merely like white geese. Regarding the second story, however, Rav Yechonah's story where he sat in a place where they would come up, they would ascend from the tefillah for the sake of gazing at him, being misboinen on the shafiri, on the beauty. In that case, Rabbanon said, aren't you afraid of Ayn Hura, which comes as a result of being noticed by people and people gazing at you and concentrating on you. On that he responded, Ayn Hara is not Shailat and Zara Yosef. Says the Bach, why was Ayn Yitzhahara not a concern in this case? Why was he not afraid? Why were they not challenging him regarding uh, the concern of the Yitzhahara inciting him? Says the Bach, we know from a Gemara elsewhere, Baba Kama Daf Kavidzayin, that Rav Yechon had very long eyebrows or eyelashes, and the Gemara there says that, uh, in fact, that he, when he wanted to look at somebody, they, he told him to please lift his eyelashes. So apparently he couldn't even see without doing so. So he wasn't concerned about the Zahara since he wouldn't notice the woman anyway. So in summary, the Gemara is teaching us a profound lesson. The Darius who were shown with the early generations, even though they weren't as great in their learning as the later generations, but nevertheless, since their mysterious nefesh was on a higher level, they were zeichet to great miracles. Whereas the Darius Acharein in the latter generations, although in their learning they surpassed the previous generations, but nevertheless, since they didn't possess the same level of mysterious nefesh, they did not merit to experience the same level of nisim of miracles. Now the Gemara before mentioned the halacha of Isha, Shekhevesh, Zerak Vikadeira, the Mishnah of Zesim, Shekvashim, Atarafeim, Tahirim. Rashi explains these halachas as follows. We know that food needs to be edible in order for it to be makabal tumah, to contract tumah. If food is inedible, it is not susceptible to be makabal tumah. Now, the halacha is that even the leaves of vegetables, even though they're not really edible, nevertheless, since they are attached to the vegetables, they're considered to be yodais, they're considered to be handles of the food, and they can contract tuma on that account, since they are attached to the food and they serve the food as a handle. 
Now, regarding the case where a woman was Kivish Yerk Rikadera, she pickled the vegetables in a pot since through the pickling process the, the leaves become soft and soggy and they can't really carry the weight of the vegetables. Should you lift the leaf, it, would, it wouldn't carry the weight, it would, it would probably just come right off. Similarly, regarding the Zesim Shekvashim Trofeim, these are the olives that were pickled with their Trofeim, with their leaves. So, since they are in the middle of a pickling process and they were getting soft and, 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 and mushy, so they can't really, you can't really handle the, the olives with, through the leaves, they would, they would simply fall off. Therefore, they're not considered to be anymore in the status of Yodais. And since they're inedible, the leaves themselves cannot be Makabal Tum. So that is the Halacha mentioned in those missions. Continues the Mishnah. Noshim va'avadim uktanim. Women, slaves, and minors. Turim mikrishma uminat filim. Now we know the general rule that an Isha is obligated to to be mekayim all the mitzvahs leisa say. All the negative commandments. She can't transgress any Yisurim. Except for uh, three, uh, three Yisurim mentioned uh, in the, the Mishnah, I believe it's in Kedushin. But otherwise, all other lay sasseis, they must, they must take care not to transgress. However, regarding mitzvah sasseis, there's a difference between mitzvah sasseis shahazman groma and mitzvah sasseis shalayazman groma. Mitzvah sasseis shahazman groma, those are mitzvahs which are time-based, which are dictated by time. They're meant to be performed in a specific zman. Regarding those mitzvahs, noshim are exempt. Regarding all other mitzvahs I say that are not time based, Shaloi Hazman Grama, Nashim Archaiv. Now, this mission lists us two mitzvahs that are mitzvahs I say Shazman Grama, and therefore Nashim Apater. One is Krishma, since it has a prescribed time, and the second one is Tfilin. Tfilin is only meant to be worn on certain days of the year, and therefore is considered to be a time based mitzvah, Hazman Grama, and Nashim Apater from those mitzvahs. The mission says Nashim Ve'avadim because a slave as well, he has the same status of an Isha regarding mitzvahs and whatever happens to an Isha, an Eved follows suit. Regarding Ketanim, a minor, Rashi explains that a Katan is Potter from Tfila. Although we're speaking about a Katan who is already a bit older, who is already Higiel HaChinuch, has come to the age of training. Nevertheless, his father is not obligated to be Mechanachim with regard to reciting Krishna, says Rashi, because it's early in the morning and the, the boy, the son, is not necessarily near his father at that time, and therefore, they did not obligate the father to instruct him to be mechanachim in this mitzvah. Regarding tefillin, Rashi explains that a katan doesn't have the ability to conduct himself properly in the proper manner fit for wearing tefillin. So that is the reason for the first part of the Mishnah, that anoshim, avodim, ektanim, are exempt from krishma and tefillin. Continues the Mishnah, v'chayoven, However, they're obligated in the following mitzvahs. But tefillah to daven. Tefillah Rashi explains is a mitzvah to Rabbonon. And a Naval was requesting Hashem's mercy. Everybody needs Hashem's rachmanus. And therefore, Chacham obligated men, women, and children to daven. Ube mezuzah, ube berchas hamazayin. Mezuzah and berchas hamazayin are more simple since they are mitzvahs that are not time-based. One is meant to have a mezuzah affixed on his doorpost at all times. Similarly, regarding berchas hamazayin, it is a... Benching is a mitzvah that is not time-based and therefore applies to all equally. Says the Gemara, Krishma Pshita. You mentioned that the Noshim are potter from Krishma. That's obvious. Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Gromahu. We know that as a general rule that Chol Mitzvah Sasei Shazman Grom and Noshim Pturois. We know that women are exempt from time-based mitzvahs. Why does the Mishnah have to explain and elaborate regarding the Chiyav, the Ptura of Noshim by Krishma? Says the Gemara, I would think perhaps Krishma is different. Then other mitzvahs, it goes into its own category. I would venture to say, since it contains Hashem's kingship, it's a declaration of Hashem's power and oneness. So it's of profound significance. And even Aisha would be Chayev, Kamash Malan, the Mishnah teaches us that is not so. She is Potter from Krishna. Continues the Gemara, Minat Tfilin. The second item mentioned in the Mishnah, an, an Isha is Pata from Tefillin. Again, the same question, Pshita, it is self-evident, it is obvious, since it is a time-based mitzvah, why do you need to teach us? Says the Gemara, Ma'udatei Ma'ud think, Ha'il v'ishkishlo mezuzah. Since in the Torah it is listed in pr- close proximity to the mitzvah mezuzah, in, in Parsha Shema it says, Ukshatim v'ishayadecha, and then the following Pasuk, it speaks about mezuzah, Ksav tamah mezuzah v'ishayadecha. So perhaps since it is 
it is uh, stated in such close proximity to mezuzah, I would connect the two, just like a mezuzah she's high of. Similarly, regarding tefillin, I would think she's high of kamash malon. The mission needs to inform us that it's not so, she's putter from mezuzah, from tefillin. So in summary, noshim avad maktanama putter from krishma and from tefillin, despite the fact that perhaps I would think otherwise. Continues, the gemara v'chayav metfila. The closing portion of the mission says that they are chayiv and tefila, they are chayiv and mezuzah, and a berachas hamazon. Says the what is the basis for the obligation to daven the rachmininu, since it involves requesting rachmanus, and everybody needs Hashem rachmanus. Therefore, hachamim did not exempt anybody from uh, this tefila experience from the obligation of davening. Says the gemara ma'ud tema, but perhaps I would think hoyel v'ksiba erev avayke v'tzoraim. Perhaps since regarding tefila. The Pasuk describes it as something which is related to evening, to morning, to noon. I would think that that makes it time-based. As considered to be like a time-based mitzvah. Kamash Malan, so the Chiddush of the mission is no. They are all chayev, they are all obligated, even women. Taisus explains that although Rashi holds that tefillah is a dirabbana, it is a rabbinic obligation, so what's the point of the Gemara now that I would think that it is a Mitzvah Seishas Man Groma since it is involved with time, Erev Avek Yitzharayim? If it is a Mitzvah Dera Bonon, then regardless of whether or not it is a Mitzvah Seishas Man Groma or not, it doesn't matter. It's not related. This concept, this rule, only applies to Dairaisis, to Biblical obligations. So why is the Gemara discussing the concept of Mitzvah Seishas Man Groma regarding Tefillah? Tesis says that although it's a Rabbinic obligation, it's a Dera Bonon, perhaps since the Rabbanon patterned their obligations based on the Torah. And since regarding tefillah we find that it is related to time, so perhaps I would think that even regarding a Rabbinic Chiv, a tefillah Rabbanon, perhaps they would exempt an Isha since it is somewhat of a Zman Groma, just like regarding the Erisis, regarding Mitzvah's the Erisis, obligations which are biblical, we exempt an Isha when it is Zman Groma, so to buy a Mitzvah the Rabbanon, therefore the Mishnah teaches us that that is not so in this case, the Chachamu wa Machayiv, everybody to daven since it is Rachmi, since it is a request for mercy. Continues the Gemara, Ube Mezuzah, the second item mentioned in the Mishnah that all are obligated is Mezuzah, Pshita, that is obvious, self-evident, why would I think not? Ma'od Tema, I would think perhaps, Hoyob Iskush Talmud Torah, since it is connected to Talmud Torah, since in the Parsha Shema it says, Teach your children Torah, and then nearby the Pasuk says, So we find that Mezuzah is, is stated next to Talmud Torah, perhaps that would connect it to, just like regarding Talmud Torah, women are exempt, they have no obligation to learn Torah. So too, regarding Mezuzah, it would follow that an Isha's Pater, Kamash Malan, the Mishnah informs that is not so, Nashim HaMachit. One last item mentioned in the Mishnah is Bircha Samazain. They are obligated to bench Pshita, that is obvious, it is not time related. Why would I think otherwise? Says the Gemara without Mahal Tema, I would think perhaps. Holy look, Siv, since the Pasuk says, Mesais Hashem Lachem Be'erev, when Hashem gives you in the evening, Pasal Echel, meat to eat, Lechem Babaykel Isboya, and bread in the morning to satiate yourself. So you see that there's such a thing as meal time. Eating is a time related activity. Perhaps, if so, Regarding the brachis, the obligations that are related to mealtime, perhaps that is too considered time-related and time-based. That is considered to be a mitzvah zeshas man groma. Kamash the mission informs us, no, that is not so. It is not considered to be a mitzvah zeshas man groma. Although the Torah dictates times for eating mealtimes, nevertheless, it is not really technically considered to be a mitzvah zeshas man groma. Now, the Mepharshim explained, this is a really Gemara and Yuma, that what happened was that Prior to, to Moshe Rabbeinu was enacting a Zman Sude, time for eating, meal time, what happened was that the Eden were Mekharkin Ketanagoyim, they would peck like, like chickens, they had no set meal time. And, and Moshe Rabbeinu didn't like that, it was, it was undignified. Therefore, he set forth for them, he established for them, based on this Pasuk, that there should be an exact, a, a, a set meal time. There should be one time, one meal time at night, which is Be'er of Basar, where you eat meat. And in the morning, by day, there should be another meal time where you eat bread. So he set forth, established a meal time, two meals a day. Interesting that in that in those days they ate two meals. They they suffice with just two meals, 
different than, than our custom today where we have three meals. Perhaps it was the Rida Sadaris, the generation of the of the um the, the Darius degenerated. It was it was a, a whole a weakness that, that uh that <laughs> descended upon mankind and now we require three meals instead of two. In any case, so that is the conclusion of the discussion about about the uh, halachas mentioned in the Mishnah. Some are obligatory on Nashim Avad Muktanim, some are not. The first part of the Mishnah discussed Krishma and Tfilin. From those mitzvahs that are mitzvahs that say Shazman Groma, that are time based, Nashim, Avadim, and Ktanim Apater. Although Krishma contains Malchus Shamayim, perhaps I would think it is more significant than other mitzvahs, nevertheless, the Mishnah teaches us they are Potter. Tfilin, perhaps I would think it is Iskish the Mezuzah, it is connected to the mitzvah Mezuzah. Just as they are chayv and mezuzah, they would be chayv and tefillin. The mission teaches us that is not so. And finally, the mission lists us three mitzvahs that are obligatory, that are chayv, even regarding noshim avadim ektanim. Number one is tefillah to daven, since it is a rachme, it is requesting Hashem as rachmanus, although it is somewhat time related. The pasuk describes it as being erev avayk of Nevertheless, the chacham obligated all to daven. Mezuzah as well, they are obligated, although uh, perhaps I would think it is Iskish the Talmud Torah. We can make a Hekish connected to the Mitzvah Talmud Torah, just as they are putter from learning, so too regarding Mezuzah. The mission informs us, no, they are Chayv and Mezuzah. And finally, regarding Birchus HaMazayin, they are required to bench, although it also seems to be somewhat time-related, as the Pasuk says, Be'erev, you eat Basar, in the morning you eat bread. Nevertheless, the mission tells us it is something all obligated to do. Continues the Gemara. Omar Rav Adabarav, this is around 12 lines, 12 lines from the top. Omar Vadabar Ava, Noshim Chayovis Bekidish Hayon Dartur. Women are Chayev to recite Kiddish on Friday night, and this is Dvar Torah. This is a mitzvah in a Torah, a biblical obligation. Says the Gemara, Amai, why are they Chayev? Mitzvah Sazei Shazman Gromu. This is a time related mitzvah, and we know the rule of the whole mitzvah Sazei Shazman Gromu and Noshim Turais. All Noshim are Potter from mitzvahs that are time related. You're right, they are not chayv midatayra, it is merely a rabbinic obligation. Rav Adabar Avar clearly says that this is a dvar toira, a mitzvah daraisa. So how can you suggest that it's only a Va'id, Another kasha. Regarding all, of, all other mitzvahs as well, all other time related mitzvahs, why there is there no rabbinic obligation? Why would this be different than anything else? If you hold that this is a Durabonon, and the Rabbonon obligated an Isha to make Kiddush, although Midaraisa is exempt on account of it being a time related mitzvah, why did the Rabbonon choose specifically here? Why only this mitzvah did they, they obligate an Isha? Why not in every, every other mitzvah of Shazman Groma? Elamarava, that can't be so. Truly, indeed, it is a Chiv Minatura, it is a biblical obligation. Your question was, isn't this a mitzvah sesh as groma? Yes, the answer is there's a specific limud, a derivation, that we learn from there that an isha is chayav in this mitzvah specifically, even though, despite the fact that it is a time related mitzvah. Elo Avrava, Omakro, the Pasuk says, Zachar Vishamar. We know that in the first commandments, in the Aser Sadibrois, mentioned in Parsha Sisroi, it says, Zachar es Yom HaShabbos Lakashay. You should remember, you should make a remembrance for Shabbos. This is referring to Kiddush to speak about Shabbos, to remember about Shabbos. V'shomer, in the second Hesar Sadibrois, related in Chumash Dvar, over there the Pasuk uses the word Shomer, guard Shabbos, referring to refraining from the, from the work, from the Malachis, from the 39 Malachis that are forbidden on Shabbos. So since they were uttered in the same utterance, we know Chazal told us that Hashem uttered these two words in the same moment, Zachar and Shabbos together. So we connect the two things. And we say as follows, Kol shiyeshin b'shmir, whoever is obligated to guard the Shabbos, yeshin b'shira, is obligated to make a remembrance for Shabbos. And since noshim, mahani noshim, yohoyel b'isnu b'shmir, since they certainly are obligated to, to guard the Shabbos, they must refrain from work on Shabbos, it is a mitzvah slaysa which applies to all. So since that applies, since shamar, the concept of shamar applies even to women, so we connect the two things, we connect zachar and shamar together, and we say just like they're obligated in shmira, isnu b'shira, they're included in the concept of Zechira as well, and they must recite Kiddush, which is indicated in the word Zachar, make a remembrance for Shabbos. So indeed, this is a mitzvah min 
as Rav Adar Rav said, Nashim Chayova is Bekidish Hayyam Dvar Torah, because we derive it from the Hekish of Zachar and Shomer. So Rav Achlegis Abayim Rav, according to Abaye, they're only Chayyam Midr Abonon, according to Rav, it is Midr Reis. What about the Chi of Abrichas Hamazan? The mission said that they are Chayyam to make Abrichas Hamazan. Is this a Dari Reis or Dari Abonon? Says the Ma'amal Avinu Rav, Nashim Bebrichas Hamazan, the obligation for women to recite Bebrichas Hamazan, is it a Dari Reis? Or is it the Rabbanon? The Mishnah didn't elaborate. The Mishnah says they're simply Chayef. But is it a Deiraisa or is it the Rabbanon? It says, well, what's the difference? Ma'af Kamina. What is the practical difference between if it's a Deiraisa or if it's a Rabbanon? Either way, they have to bench. It says, the more difference is as follows. The question is whether they have the ability to be moitzi, to exempt others from their obligation. If they recite Birch Samazain on behalf of somebody else, somebody else is listening out to their recitation, are they yaitzi? Do they fulfill their obligation in this manner? Explains the Gemara. I amris doi raisa. If their chiv, the isha is obligated to say berch samazim midoi raisa. In that case, it would work. Ose doi raisa, mafik doi raisa. One person who is obligated to do something with raisa can do it on behalf of somebody else. We know there's a concept of we call Yisrael aravim zevazeh. They are mixed in. Aravim zevazeh. They're mixed in with each other. They're responsible for each other. They're an arav for each other. The two different explanations of the word arav. They're mixed in with each other. Our neshamas, our souls are interconnected, interrelated. Whereas one, we're united, and therefore one can do a mitzvah for the other. Or the simple pshat is called Yisrael aravim zevazeh, like an arav, like a somebody's a guarantor. We're responsible for each other. And since we're responsible for each other, we can be mighty each other. So that's the concept of one being mighty the other. So in our case, if an isha, if a woman is obligated to recite Birch Samazoin Midar Raisa, it is a biblical obligation. So certainly she can be mighty, she can exempt, she can discharge another person from his chiyuv, from his mitzvah, by merely listening to her recitation. Eli Amr Sirabon Havi, if it's a mere rabbinic obligation, then she can't do it. She can't be mighty, one who has a much greater obligation, who has a mitzvah Dar Raisa. So Minatur is considered like an Eine Mechui V'davar, like she's not obligated. We know one who is not Mechui V'davar, Eine Mechui cannot exempt the Rav and the public from their obligation. So the question remains, is the Chiv that is applied to Isha regarding Birch HaSamaz and she Mechui of Midaraisa and then she can be mighty somebody else or is it merely Midarabonan and she cannot be mighty, she can't, she can't Bench on behalf of somebody else. My, what is the conclusion? Toshma, let's listen. Be'emes amru. We know a halacha as follows. Ben mevarach la'aviv. A child can make a bracha on behalf of his father. Ve'evid mevarach la'rabi. A slave can do so for his master. Ve'isham mevarach la'bala. And a woman can do so for her husband. If they listen in to their recitation, the father to his son's recitation, the master to his eved, the husband to his wife, they are yaitzi, they fulfill the obligation. Avla Amr HaChacham and HaChacham said as follows, Tabe Me'era should come a curse, the Adam to a person who is so unlearned that he needs to resort, she ishti Yivan of that his wife and children bless for him. So that's the conclusion of this halacha, that we see from this, from this halacha that they can, an Isha can exempt her husband. It all works well if her chiyav, her obligation is the raisa. So therefore, also the raisa will come her the raisa obligation, will mafik the raisa, and will exempt him from his biblical obligation. But if her chiyav is merely rabbinic, how can you say that she could exempt him? Can her chiyav, which is merely a rabbinic obligation, mafik the raisa, can she discharge one who has a chiyav the raisa? That can't work. So we have a riot, we have a solid proof from here, it appears that the chiv of the Isha is midaraisa. Says the Gemara Tamech, but according to your reasoning, how are you going to explain the other halacha mentioned here? Katan bar How could a katan be moitzi? Fine, it's all well regarding an Isha. You prove the point, an Isha is chayv midaraisa, she should be moitzi, your husband. How are you going to explain a katan? A katan certainly, a minor certainly only midrabanan. And even regarding a katan we see the same halacha, that he could be moitzi, his father. Ella, so you must resort to explaining this halacha in a different light. Hacha, my skin, we're speaking about kigon she'achal shiur drabanon. That what happened was that the adult, the father, for instance, only ate a shiur drabanon, a small amount of bread, which only obligates him to bench to say berch samazayin mid drabanon, because as we'll see in the coming gemara, min ha'toyra, one is only obligated to bench when he ate kadei sevia, an amount which satiates him, as it says in the pasuk about chalta v'savata, he'll be satiated. 
then you'll bless, then you'll say Berch Samosen. Midr Abbanon, one is required to bench even if you only ate a small amount of Shir Abbanon, a Kezayis or Kebet, like we'll see in the, in the coming Gemara. So that's what this halach is referring to. It's referring to an adult who ate merely a small Shir, Shir Abbanon. So since his obligation to recite Berch Samosen is merely Midr Abbanon, so certainly a Katan can be Maitzim. Because his Chiv Dera Abbanon, a Katan's Chiv to recite Berch Samosen is only Dera Abbanon, but nevertheless, it can be mighty a gadol who is only chay of midrabanon since he only ate a small amount. Let's see the gemara again. Ach, my skin, and we're speaking about the following scenario: Can she'achal shiur midrabanon with the adult only ate a small amount, which obligates him merely midrabanon? And certainly, the asid rabbanon, the child who is only obligated midrabanon, can come and exempt and be mighty mapik midrabanon. Can be mighty his father who is also only mechayiv midrabanon. So similarly, regarding the isha, we have no proof from here that her obligation is biblical. Perhaps she only has a chayiv midrabanon. So how can she be mighty, her husband? We're speaking about her husband. Her husband was only chayv and rabbanon since he only ate a small shear. So certainly she can be mighty him as well. So in conclusion, what is the chayv of an isha? So regarding shamar, regarding guarding the Shabbos, refraining from malacha, since it is a mitzvah loisase, is a prohibition, she is mechayv, she is obligated equally as a man. Regarding zachar, Uttering a remembrance about Shabbos, reciting Kiddush, we have a machlekes Abayi Verovah. According to Abayi, it is only a rabbinic, it is only mid a rabbinic obligation according to Rava. We connect Zachar and Shamar, we make a hekesh, just as she is mechuyiv in Shamar, she is mechuyiv in Zachar, it is a chiv de raisa. And finally, regarding Berchas Hamazayin, the Gemara left it open as a question. Is it mid raisa, is it mid without any conclusion. Continues the Gemara, Darash Ravira, Ravira taught us the following drasha. Zimnin Amar la Meshmei de Ravami. On occasion, he would quote it in the name of Ravami. Vizimnin on different occasions, Amar la Meshmei de Ravasi. He would quote it in the name of Ravasi, as follows: Amru Malachi Ashores of Nekadish Baruch Hu. The Malachim complained to Hashem, Rabbi Nishalelam, Mass of the World. Doesn't it say in your Torah, Kaser v'Sere Secha, Asher lo Yisapanim? Hashem, you don't show favoritism to anybody. V'lo Yikach Sheicha, you don't accept a bribe. And then again it says, V'lo Yata Lo Yisapanim Yisrael. Then we find that you do. That you do show favoritism to the Yidin. As it says in the Pasa, Gisa Hashem Panavelach. Hashem will show favoritism to you, to Yidin. How is this consistent? Says the Gemara, Armor them, Hashem responds to them, How can I not do so? How can I not show favoritism to Yisrael? How can I not do that to call Yisrael? Since I have written to them in the Torah, You should eat, be full, be satiated, and only then. You're obligated to overrachta shem lakecha to recite berachas amazon. So that is the obligation that I dictated, dictated to them in the Torah. Only once you're satiated, you're full. Only then do you bench. However, vehem medachtikin alatzman. They are exacting on upon themselves. They're stringent. They're machmir. At kezayis at kebetsa. Even if they're not full, they only eat a small amount, the size of a kezayis, an olive, or kebetsa, an egg. They already go ahead and they say berachas amazon since. They are going beyond the letter of the law. They're going the extra mile. They're coming towards me. So, Mida connected Mida. I respond to them accordingly and I show favor to them. Continues the mission. Balkari, one who is tummy with the tomb of Balkari, who had a discharge. And we know that Ezra was Mesakin, a Takana. This is mentioned in the Gemara later on. That a Balkari must refrain from saying words of Torah and words of Tfila. So, what does he do regarding Krishna? Regarding Birchas Krishma, says the Mishnah, Baal Keri Mahar Balibai. He merely thinks the words of Krishna in his heart without expressing it with his lips. But he doesn't make a bracha, he doesn't make the bracha prior or post Krishna, explains Rashi, because Krishna is Minatoira, therefore he is Mahar, but the brachas of Krishna is only Midarabanan, therefore he is not Mahar regarding those brachas. Regarding food, if he has bread, if he eats bread, he needs to make a bracha following the bread through hearer, through thinking. However, regarding the bracha prior to eating bread, that he does not say. He makes the bracha before and after food, and before and after Krishna. The Gemara later will explain the reason for this machlekes. Amr Ravina says Ravina as follows We can learn from this Mishnah a very profound lesson regarding other halachis. The mission says that a Balkari, since he's not allowed to express, to utter the words of Krishna, of Brichas Krishna, Brichas so what does he do? 
He's Mahara Balivoy. He contemplates, he thinks the words in his heart. Apparently, doing so, by doing so, he fulfills his obligation. Because otherwise, otherwise, what's the point? What's the purpose? So we see from here that universally speaking, all over, whenever a person is Mahara Balivoy, he can be Yitzhak in, in that manner, in that fashion, even though he's not expressing it. Let's see inside. Amar Avina, Zoysamaris. This Mishnah teaches us, informs us that Hirur Kedibur Dami, that merely thinking the words is equated with saying the words. The Isal Kedaitach, because if you'll propose that Lav Kedibur Dami, they are not equated. Lova Maharif. So what's the point of this person being Mahar? So it's Gmar Elamai. Okay, let's go along with that. So you're proposing to us that Hirur is Kedibur Dami. If so, Yoytzi Besvasav. So why can't he just utter the words? Why can't he just express them? If you're saying that hearer has the same legal status as speaking, so if we allow this person to think the words, to be Mahar Baliboy, since it is tantamount to expressing the words, so let him just go express the words. What's the gain, what's the benefit of being Mahar? Says the Gemara, nevertheless, even though halakhically speaking, hearer has the same legal status as, spe- as speaking, that is regarding fulfilling one's obligation universally, regarding Krishna, regarding Tefillah, all over. However, this specific Allah of Abal Kari, his limitation is limited to uttering words of Torah and Tefillah. Why? Says the Gemara, we follow the pattern that we find in Sinai. The, the explanation is as follows. Regarding the restriction of Abal Kari that is mentioned during Matan Torah, Hashem told them, you should refrain from this type of Tumah, make sure you purify yourself from this Tumah that's related to Zera, to Abal Kari. That was in the context of speech. It was regarding speaking words of Torah. Why? Explains Torah, since the Torah was, was given to them, was spoken to them by Hashem, by Moshe, and the Yidin were listening. They were oina, they were listening. They were shemeya, they were listening. The halacha is that shemeya, listening, is koina, has the same status as actually uttering the words. Therefore, since we find that regarding the restriction of Valkyrie by Matan Torah was limited strictly to a case, an event where there was speaking, where there was an utterance of words of Torah. Similarly, when Ezra was Masak in his Takana, he patterned it after what we found, the halacha that we find by Har Sinai. And since over there it was merely applicable to speech, similarly Ezra was only Masak in the Takana of a Balkari with regard to actual speech. But if one is merely Bimahar, that's okay. So again, although regarding fulfilling one's obligation, Regarding Krishna, Tefillah, if one is merely Mahara, that's tantamount to speaking. It's equated to uttering the word and he's Yaitse. However, regarding Baal Keri, there's a difference. Since he is not actually expressing the words, that's okay, that's acceptable for Baal Keri. Therefore, we tell him, we instruct him to be, merely be Mahara and fulfill his obligation in that manner. So, this is the Shita of Ravina that Hirur is equated with Dibur. Says Rav Chizah, no, that's not the case. Rav Chizah Omar, no, Hirur loved Dibur Dami. Thinking is not equated with speaking. If you contemplate, you think that we can equate the two things, that here is Kedibur, that's the case, so in our Mishnah, what's the gain, what's the advantage of thinking? If thinking and speaking are equated, let him just go speak. If you allow him to think, let, let him speak. So this is the same kasha we had before in Ravina. Says the Gemara, Ela Mai, here love Kedibur Dami. Okay, so you're proposing that there's a difference. Here is not Kedibur. Here it doesn't have the same status as Dibur, and if one should go ahead and think about Krishna, or think about Tefillah, he has not fulfilled his obligation, all over, kol chot kula. It is not Kedibur Dami. If so, so what's the point of this person, being Mahar, Loma Mahar? What is he doing? He's not doing anything, he's not fulfilling any, any obligation according to you. According to Ravina, he's fulfilling his obligation in full. According to you, he's not fulfilled anything. So why do we tell him to be Mahar, Loma Mahar? Amr Blazer, you know why? Even though he doesn't fulfill any obligation, there's a side reason. Kedei shelo yoyo kola oilam as oiskin boy bu yoyo bottle. The reason is since we don't want that the public, the whole world should be involved now in saying Krishna, and he's sitting on the side being idle. Therefore we want him to partake in the communal activity and somehow be involved at least through her. Says the Gemara, Venigris Bhrika If that's the point, let him simply speak other words which are allowed to a Balkari. The Gemara later will explain that there are certain parts of Torah that a Balkari can speak. So let him speak in those words. If the point is just not to separate himself from the community, to be involved in the spiritual activity, let him go ahead and say words that he's allowed to speak. 
says the Gemara, we want him to be involved in that activity that the Tzibur, the congregation is involved in. Since they are involved in Krishna, he too must take part in that Mimaharar in words of Krishna. Says the Gemara, regarding Tfila, the Dava Shatsibar Sukhimboy, that is something that the congregation was being involved in, and we find that he is not obligated to take part. The Tanan, how you with Tfila, if one was in the middle of David and Veniska, he reminded himself, Shu Balkari, that he's a Balkari, Lo Yafsik. He doesn't need to stop. Eli Katzer, he should make an abridged version, he should stop, he should be Mikatzer, and uh, shorten his Tfila. Time of the Askel. This mission tells us very clearly that only once he begins, so he may continue and shorten his tefillah and conclude in that manner. But if he wouldn't have begun, he can't begin. So we see here that even though he's involved in a congregation right now that's davening, he must sit idle and he can't take part. So as the Gemara Shani, tefillah, the less mamacho shamayim. Tefillah is not so strange, it doesn't assume the same status as Krishna since it doesn't include a reference to Machal Shemayim, to Hashem's kingship, so it is not so crucial for him to take part. It's only by Krishna, since it is Machal Shemayim, we obligate him to take part, not to stay separate and to sit idle. So as the Gemara Vahari, Birch HaSamazin La'achrav. Regarding Birch HaSamazin post meal, the less by Machal Shemayim, it doesn't either involve the acceptance of Hashem's kingship, Utsunan, and we find in the Mishnah, Halamazin, Varch La'achrabin, Varch La'fanov, that he is required to be Maharer, to contemplate the words of Birch HaSamazin, even though this concept of Machal Shemayim won't apply. So why there is it obligated? Says the Gemara, Ella, you must say, the reason is different. Krishma Birch HaSamazin, Dairaisa. There's a difference whether it's a rabbinic obligation or a biblical obligation. Regarding a chiyim a daraisa, like Krishma, over there we want to contemplate these words and not to completely disregard them. We want to be, to be involved in these words somewhat. And therefore, he's being maharer. We tell him to be maharer by Krishma. We tell him to be maharer by Hamazain. However, regarding tefillah, the, pas- the, the Mishnah which indicates that if he hadn't yet begun tefillah, then he should not involve himself at all. He should, doesn't even need to be maharer. That's because tefillah is darbana, is merely darbana, and therefore we don't obligate him to do hira. So in summary, what is the halacha of Ibal Kari? So according to Rabbi Yehuda, he may recite all the brachas. According to Tanakama, he not, cannot verbalize any brachas, but he is obligated to be maharer, to think. Regarding things that are chiyuvim, obligations, like Kriyashma, like Birchas Hamazain. Now, what is the purpose of this hirur? According to Rav, Ravina, it's because hirur kedibur dami. Thinking, contemplating about the words are equated to actually verbalizing them. So, although regarding a Baal Keri, we say that since he doesn't verbalize the words, that's okay. But however, regarding fulfillment of obligation, hirur is equated with verbalization, and therefore he is required to be maharer so that he fulfills his obligation. Regarding mitzvahs de raisa, according to Rav Chizda, hirur is lav kedibur dami, is not equated to speech, and he does not fulfill any obligation. So why then is he required to be maharer? So that he gets involved somewhat with these very important activities of mitzvahs de raisa, like Krishma, al Abricha Samazain, that he doesn't remain completely, completely idle and uninvolved, therefore he's required at least to be maharat to contemplate on the content of these mitzvahs.